How many of you remember this image, the Hubble Deep Field? How many of you have never seen this image of the Hubble Deep Field before? It's okay if you haven't. There's no judge. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because, well, first of all, it was 1996. Maybe some of you guys weren't even born yet. But, uh, but it is an image that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 1995, actually, over the, the winter holidays of 1995, um, that deliberately and kind of on a, uh, you know, just to see in a pure exploration mode, pointed the telescope at an empty spot in the sky that had no really visible stars in it, actually maybe one or two, <laughs> and left the exposure open for almost 10 days. They did different filters, so it wasn't just that they kept it all open for one, but adding it all up, 10 days of exposures, uh, just to see what's in an empty, dark spot of the sky. So I should have preceded this with a black slide, mm -hmm. and then with 10 days of looking with the Hubble telescope, this is what they saw. Not an empty sky at all filled with galaxies, thousands of galaxies. And the presumption was that this is what the whole sky looks like. No matter where you look, the sky is just lousy with galaxies. <laughs> I've mentioned here before, I used to work at Space Telescope Science Institute. I remember uh, that winter, uh, we had holiday parties, and I remember that they had dips of all the different filters. So you had, oh, I'm going to take from the purple dip or the blue dip. Um, but it was a, a major deal. The Institute was very excited about it. And so just to make sure they did it again uh, and pointed in the opposite direction for the Hubble Deep Field South. And again, thousands of galaxies, just the sky. This is, if you had super, super sensitive eyes, this is what the sky truly looks like. It's just packed with galaxies. So uh, this, of course, is a treasure trove of scientific discovery. Um, there have been several uh, images taken since, one called the ultra deep field, because if you want a deep field, then you can go even more so, longer exposure, and you get the ultra deep field. And what's after ultra? Well, of course, the extreme <laughs> deep field. So they all uh, were, as you can see, sort of small parcels of the sky. You can see how they scale compared to the moon tiny postage stamp of the sky. Now there's one called the legacy field. It is the size of the moon. And I can only tell you that the amount of science that we get out of this, looking all the way back to the time when galaxies were first forming, this far back as you can see visible light coming, uh, is what we look at when we see the Hubble deep field. One of the major outcomes that came from that, from a science point of view, <coughs> was that galaxies change. You can see that at the top there are sort of what galaxies look like now, beautifully formed, spiral arms, you know, what your canonical picture of a galaxy. But as you look further and further back in time, they get messier and sloppier and more like shreds of galaxies. Um, and so we're watching cosmic evolution the, from the farthest back pieces of little spits of stuff forming, coagulating, forming some more, merging some more into the universe as we see it today. Because as you look back out into great distances in space, you're looking back in time. Because it takes time for that light to travel from far, far away to your eyes. So the light that's hitting your eyes now from a 10 billion light years away is light that left that object 10 billion years ago. So you're looking out in space is like looking back in time, and that's why they sometimes call the Hubble Space Telescope a time machine, because we can look into the past. So it was not only, of course, a scientific achievement, it is awe-inspiring. And that leads us to uh, the subject of the rest of this uh, first part this evening, to hear from our guest, Eric Whitaker. Why don't you come to the stage, Eric? Yeah, thank you, Lynn. And uh, yay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You can, um, oh, do you have it? You can do it down there? I got a clicker, yeah. We were good. Didn't it? Perfect. So um, I got to ask, is that you? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, say the name of the piece so we can get the calendar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was the last song you heard. Yeah, that's me in 1987, <laughs> or 86, 86 I yeah, yeah, I think. It's a picture I, from 87, but I wrote the, the tune in 86. 16 years old, <laughs> oh very sophisticated, but look, look what he became. 
So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry to uh, to oh have embarrassed God. you, but we, we, we couldn't. I think you can tell now, seeing the show, we couldn't resist that. <laughs> it's just too hard to resist. So, uh, so we are thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm honored. Thank you. And um, why don't you s just tell us a little bit about the genesis of this? Actually, I would like to ask you first. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you saw the Hubble? Uh, deep field image. Oh yeah, I absolutely do. So I was a space nerd since I was nine years old. I, I had my, this is back in 1979, and I got, I grew up in northern Nevada, and so I, I got a little telescope for Christmas, and I would go out every night just entranced. I, I really thought I was going to be an astrophysicist until I was 18 and realized I was no good at math, but uh, <laughs> uh, that this re it was truly a passion for me. It still is, and so I remember in 1990 when the Hubble telescope launched, and it was so exciting. I, I couldn't wait to, do all of you remember it? It promised, well some of you are too young, but it, it was gonna be, it was the, the most complex machine ever built. Yeah. It promised these views of, of space that we'd never seen before. But like we were talking before, Laura, when it first opened, it didn't work. That's part of the story that people don't talk about a lot is that, um, that there was a, an a aberration on the mirror, a very tiny aberration, it was the largest mirror ever built, and now it's in space, and what do you do to fix this thing? And remember at the time, they, they called for NASA's dissolution. Yeah. Congress did what they always do. They said, let's get rid of NASA. <laughs> <laughs> they had also lost a mission to Mars. And if you've seen the, uh, um, oh, the Leslie Nielsen movie with the disasters, he goes into a bar, we've shown it in here before, and there are pictures of disasters on the wall, like the Hindenburg and then the Hubble telescope. What was telescope the Hubble, oh my God, yeah. And those of us who worked there were, oh, ouch. <laughs> so it, it, it still worked, but the images were blurred. Yeah, that's it, the, they yeah. were coming back blurry, but then NASA did what they always do, they just rolled up their sleeves and figured it out, and they sent up a bunch of shuttle missions to, to repair it, and a combination of fixing it, the telescope in space, and then software corrections on the ground, they essentially put a contact lens on the Hubble telescope. And so I remember very distinctly when it started working, right? This was about 92, 93, when the images were really coming back. And so I, I was following along when Bob Williams decided to point the telescope at this dark area of sky. I, I just couldn't wait to see what was there. And then when those images came back, to me, that Hubble, the D-field image, that's the most important image in human history. Because, mm -hmm. right, the, those, those are galaxies, those aren't stars, mm -hmm. right? So each one of those dots represent hundreds of billions of stars in this tiny sliver of the sky. And it, for me, it just, it's, uh, it showed me how impossibly large the universe is and how truly small we are in it. So since I saw this image, um, I've been enchanted by it. And then about five years ago, I decided to write a piece of music about it. And how do you do that? How do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, here's this, and then, because I, I, I know I, I tweeted something the other day about how would you score the universe? Confronted with this, I'd like to ask everyone in the room to take a moment and think what what do you hear in your imagination? Whales. <laughs> it's so, probably the closest thing, actually. So, so how, how did you get Well, for me, I started this way. Um, I, uh, it's very easy as a composer to become paralyzed. You know, you sit down with a blank piece of paper, and, and you've got Bach on one shoulder and Mozart on the other, and they're all telling you that if you would have studied harder, you could have been an architect or an astrophysicist. <laughs> But, um, so th this was drawn by my son, who was five at the time, he's 13. Uh, and we were in London, it was a rainy day, and he, he drew this, and so he made my name, E-R-I-C. And then there's all these pictures around the, the side, so I asked Ash, I said, what are all these pictures? Let me see if this works. So he said, this is a rainbow skull and crossbones. <laughs> this is a giant pyramid of cheese. <laughs> this is a rain cloud raining on Zeus, who is shooting lightning bolts down on a snake wearing pants. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and this is an alien baby playing hot dogs and maracas. <laughs> So any of you who have children know this is the kind of acid trip thing they say all the time, <laughs> I don't know where this comes from. But what I was really struck by it was, was watching how, how unironic he was. It's completely, he said with absolute conviction, that is a snake wearing pants. <laughs> right? That's what he meant, that's what it was. And, and there's no sense of judgment, right? It's just, he's just exploring and learning and, and pushing and pulling colors. And I found that so beautiful and in a way liberating. So I started doing it myself when I was writing pieces. This is a piece, a different piece called Equus which in Latin simply means horse. And so I sat down with a blank piece of paper and I just started drawing. 
And my goal was to keep my hand moving and no judgment at all. And the first thing I did was make this Pokeball Death Star wheel here in the middle. <laughs> and then I just wrote descriptive words around it, strong and delicate and exciting, awe-inspiring, just things that I wanted the piece to be without having written a note. And when I, when I would start to get cloudy or start to be judgmental, I would just start playing number games here. There's some Fibonacci stuff here, which actually ended up in deep field. And then finally, at the top left-hand corner, I just wrote the first notes that came into my head. It's this little simple tune. Do, 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 That's all it was. And I, I didn't think, is this good? Is this bad? I just wrote it down, and it turned out to be the exact notes that are the main theme of this piece that I wrote called Equus. Uh, I've had the chance now to work on a couple of films with the film composer Hans Zimmer. Mm -hmm. And he's got this, this great uh, saying, which is, why go with your fifth bad idea when you can go with your first bad idea? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love that. So, so when I sat down then to write Deep Field, how do we map out the universe in music, then what I did is I, I, I started with inspiration from the Hubble itself. And the idea was I'd write a piece of music that was out of focus most of the time, musically out of focus. So it would sound out of focus, and then it would flirt with being in focus, and then go back, and then flirt and go back. And so what I did is I knew that I wanted to start slow and static and low strings. I wrote La Mer, which is a piece by Debussy. <laughs> I just, I love the way it starts with the harp and the strings just kind of bubbling. And, and then I knew that it would have these, these um, kind of plateaus as we got closer and closer to a fully realized image. And it would, it would almost be in focus and not almost. And then I wrote the chord. I found the chord that I thought this is what it would sound like, this huge thing here where it says focus. And to me, I was trying to capture the feeling I have when I look at the deep field image, which is one of wonder and awe and maybe even fear. I, I don't know what that, I'm not a religious person, but I, every time I look at that deep field image, I feel like I just have to fall to my knees. It's, it's impossibly large. And so I, I even, I just, wrote down a line of poetry that I knew, reached out and touched the face of God, which is just the feeling that I wanted the audience and the musicians to have at that moment. So I basically built this whole thing, just a few musical motives, and then I knew that this would be the architecture for the whole piece, that, that now I have the, the framework. And then, do you want me to keep going? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so then... <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. No one's interested. <laughs> So, so then what, what I'm doing for, uh, what, what I do when, I'm, when I start the next part of the process is I'm, I look for what I call the golden brick. And the golden brick for me is just a few notes or a single chord. In this case, the, the focus chord is one of those golden bricks. But a, a few notes that, that has all of the DNA for the entire piece in it. That on the macro and the micro level, all of the thing that I want to express is in those few notes. And classical composers have been doing this for centuries. Uh, this is a very famous four note motive by Bach, and he used it in over a dozen pieces. And why these four notes? Mm -hmm. Spells out his name, right? <laughs> B natural is H in German. So, so for me, when, when I sat down to, to sketch out my, my deep field golden brick, what I knew that I wanted to do is build into the notes themselves the, the journey that NASA took. So I, I knew that the melody had to be simple because it was going to be huge and grand and it, spend a lot of time on it. So the, the first three notes are, I wrote down failure, and it's just do, do, do. Those three simple notes, descending, right? And then the notes that you were calling the bell notes. Dun, dun, dun. So the idea is it reaches, it's aspirational, but then it falls again, doesn't quite reach its goal. Then dun, 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 dun at the pinnacle, finally reached the goal, and you'll see that blue line there. I can talk about that later on. And then, bum, bum, bum. The exact same three notes as the first part of, the, of this golden brick, but now changed because of the journey itself, right? A sense of catharsis. So in just those few notes, ideally, becomes the whole journey. And then what I did is I wrote the entire piece based only on those notes. Mm -hmm. So it's a 23-minute piece. We're not going to hear all of it here tonight. Uh, but the entire piece is, is every little moment is based some, some variation on those things. And I'll play just a little bit here. Is that okay, Laura? So this is from a performance in London. This is like four minutes into the piece. So you hear the oboes. They're playing the... But it's two oboes. They're breaking up the melody, right? So it's not quite in focus. And then you hear behind them all the flutes going... So all they're doing is going, da, da, 
dun, 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 dun. They're doing those first three notes of the golden, but they're doing it at different tempos so that it's blurred, so nothing's in focus. Second oboe takes the melody. So that's the basic idea. So the, the, then the piece on, on the, the biggest level and the smallest level does that kind of thing. And so what I knew, I wanted, the, the, the other thing I was gonna say about the shape of this golden mean melody is that it's designed so that it's on the micro level, it matches the macro level. You see them? The shape is exactly the same. And then the piece, we could, we could super nerd out, out on this if we wanted to, but every bit of the piece has that shape in it on the small level, on the medium levels, on the big levels, those kinds of notes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we were talking ahead of time. There, it, there, it, it's, it, for each of those themes, and there's also the first one, which is just that diminished da da at the very the opening. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So you actually start with two before you know. I mean, you before know, it fully realizes. Know. But but each of these goes a goes from a you know very very quiet and then oh it might get as loud as piano, which it means soft, and then it dies away again. Yeah. And each of those uh, th themes is played very slowly, as you can tell the tempos. And there was another thing you know it just takes which is not something we're used to. And it was one of the things when we, and we will listen to a little bit in a minute. I know I have some stuff, you probably have some stuff, we'll figure it out, Please. we didn't rehearse this ahead of time, but um, it, it, you just, I had to slow down to listen to it. I mean, I had to not just kind of, oh, and, and you ruined so many weekends of mine because, because I was gonna, like, like, oh, that, I'll, I'll just on. put it on the background while I do the dishes, like, oh, no. No, 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 that's not happening. I had to go out and wait, what was that? You know, and I, my, my house is still a mess. But, uh, uh, you know, because you can't, you, can't, you can't be about other things. They're, it's just so focused and takes you right to this core. And I, I, I look forward to sharing a little bit more. Oh, I love that, thank with. you. Part of, part of what I was trying to do is, is, is make the audience feel the magnitude of space, but those long, long lines, yeah. so, so that you have to slow down. Yeah. One of the ways that I did it in terms of writing was, because I wasn't sure how long one could sustain that kind of sound, so I took some of my favorite film scores. I took Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, I took uh, a Jerry Goldsmith, one of the early Star Trek movies, mm -hmm. some James Horner stuff, and then what I did is I used a, a program called Paul Stretch, and you can take an audio file and you can stretch it so I, I stretch these files like 1,500%. So say a three minute uh, cue in Close Encounters of the Third Kind now takes 45 minutes to happen, <laughs> right? So you might have, say, a drum that goes right? But if you stretch that 1,500%, it takes 30 seconds. Right, that moment. And so I just walked around all the time listening to this super slowed down music. <laughs> Trying to see Did how long can you? Slowly? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure I bumped into a few trees. Uh, but how long could one sustain that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, and I, I have one more clip. Can I play oh, it? Of the music. So, so I'll play you that moment. Then we talked about the focus moment, right? Um, and so this is leading up to it. Uh, a small caveat. So this was performed in London at Royal Albert Hall, um, and I'm conducting. And you'll, you'll know the moment that that chord happens because you'll see it in my face. Uh, I apologize yeah. now for the face. <laughs> um, the, all I will say is that if you ever get the chance to stand with 100 people on stage and it's, there's this bass drum that is rumbling so loud that it actually shakes the podium, anyway, really do it. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's, here's what the moment when it comes into full focus sounds like.
No, oh. no, that's it. Yeah, that's oh. it. Yeah. <laughs> If I, if I may, I, I'm, I'd like to pick up, if I may. Yeah, please. Uh, because I think this is a good time to listen to the last ah, okay. five minutes of the piece. Yeah. Perfect. Because you've heard the build-up, you know what this is about, and I, as I said, we'll take questions afterwards, so it all will be answered, but um, it will take time. And, but after 13 and a half billion years of evolution <laughs> of the universe, we can take five minutes. So, um, so I'm going to go forward. You might be amused if I can do this. There's the, my descending minor second. Oh, yeah, There's yeah. your three, four, one, the bells <laughs> theme. Then ascending four notes. The noodling. In the noodling. Yeah. And the, so you can see I did all of those. And then, then it builds, and it builds to what you just heard. And then the three themes together. Yeah, exactly. So I, and we didn't plan, but I was like, yeah, because these three yeah. themes, you can't miss them. So the, the descending and anyway. So. And and Laura, real quick before you play it, so this yeah. last bit, as the as the singers are singing, this is the the first time in the piece that you'll hear that golden brick in focus. So it's unadorned. It's just that's the first time you hear that whole melody with uh, clearly. So we have just come off that big note, and this is what happens.
the direction on the score says uh, diminuendo al niente, uh, diminished to nothing. Enjoy the silence. Enjoy the silence, that's right. <laughs> Depeche Mode in the house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was that was a walk-in song. I don't know if you saw the. Oh, was we it had really? Depeche Mode for you as oh. well. Um, uh, oh, I had so many things I wanted to say, and suddenly my mind is totally fried. So, the voice, voices, the use of voice. You're known as a choral composer, in great measure. Yeah. But you held off, you know, twenty minutes before you brought in voice. What was that about? What did that have a significance to you? Uh, yeah, you know, writing the whole piece was such a, a, a metaphysical journey in a way because ultimately I look at these images, I was just now as we were listening to and thinking, what is our place in the cosmos? It's, I, I, who are we really? I mean, we're this speck of dust in the middle of nowhere, in the, just the furthest reach. And are there more of us? Are there not? Are we advanced? Are we not? Is, and everything we feel, our, our emotional life, our, our, the the whole mystery of the human experience. Is it, is it just a chemical anomaly that's happening on this little planet in the middle of no, do you know what I mean? So, so yeah, so, so, <laughs> so, so I remember writing all of this and, and then very intentionally thinking there's, there's, I love writing for orchestra. I, I adore it. Um, but there's, I, I always find there's, there's just a little distance with any kind of instrument. There's literally distance between you and the audience, right? There's some sort of implement between you and the audience. And so that I wanted to create this stoic, almost, um, uh, it's just an unpartial view of the universe. It's neither good nor bad nor human, it just simply is. Here's what it is. And then, only then, at the very end, do, we, do I bring in the voices with this idea, okay, here's our place in the cosmos. This is us. And I struggled with it a lot. I thought, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Why, what is the universe? How, did, how does it see us? Is it emotional at all? What's the famous line about the, that humans are the universe dreaming itself into existence? And so I didn't, I, I didn't know where that was and where I finally landed are those, those chords that just keep happening at the end. And I just had this image of this, this mother's embrace that somehow we were being cradled in a way by the universe, that ultimately it's a benevolent force in the universe. Again, I'm not a religious person, but uh, yeah, I, I, all I has, have is intuition to make me feel that way. But listening to it over and over, it, it reinforces my feeling. Yeah. For me, I, I thought it felt like breath, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. inhalation, exhalation, and a sigh. And I thought, oh, it's like the universe is brought to life. That's inspiration of of life, not just stars and planets, but life as well. It's very much that too. I use that breath motive a lot in, in a lot of pieces that I've written, right? And to sometimes intentionally to get the audience to breathe at, at the right times. Um, yeah, it's funny because I was listening to this at the end. I was doing the breathing in time with it too. It's nice, right? By the end of it, you're <laughs> a little more chilled out. <laughs> it is. It's a. It's 23 minutes long, and uh, and it just takes you to another place. It's a beautiful meditation. May um, I ask one thing? Of course. Uh, was Neptune of the planets at all in your mind? Uh, you mean be, because of the choir? That uh, no, it's so way? funny you ask that because so th there's a very, <laughs> very famous classical piece called The Planets by Gustav Holst. No Pluto in, in the planets. So, <laughs> he, so he was before, before his time Pluto. and prescient. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, but, but yeah, I had to reconcile in a big way with, with the planets, right? Because Anytime the horns come in, bump, bump, but it's like, oh, there's Mars, or there's, you know, like, like this damn composer got there a hundred years earlier, and so, <laughs> so I remember with Neptune thinking, is that a thing? With the, right when the voices come in and the whole, it, it wasn't, but okay. <laughs> Holst. Did you see the Questions? Uh, station. Have they played KUSC? Have they played this piece? They, they have a couple of times. Uh, you can imagine it's kind of a late night thing because it's maybe the worst drive time piece ever. <laughs> 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 it starts so quiet and you turn it up and then 20 minutes later, ah! <laughs> <laughs> not exactly, not car talk, that's right. <laughs> do you anticipate a performance in Los Angeles? Yeah, we'd love to do it with the LA Phil. We're talking to them now. Oh, yeah, good. For sure. Yeah. It's, and, and the ever magnificent LA Master Chorale, who just yes, yeah, spectacular, spectacular. Question. It sounded as if the vocals were done in the very resonant room. Uh -huh. Were they pre-recorded and then added in? 
or were, or, were they, or were they live in some sort of a sound chamber? Okay, so to, great ears, by the way. Uh, so to, to add more complexity to this piece already, uh, for the past 10 years, I've been making these things called virtual choirs. And there's a, some virtual choir members here in the audience, yes? Oh, yay, yeah, amazing. Choir. Like, stand up. I want to yeah, say will you, thank virtual you. Virtual choir members, will oh you stand up? Oh my God. <laughs> so, the very basic idea with virtual choirs is that, well, actually, do we have time? I can show it the tiniest yeah, clip yeah, of one. Yeah. yeah, so. Um, I mean, I, it's okay with you they're guys? Evenly distributed. <laughs> they're evenly distributed here. I know. Maybe, they can I know. Maybe we take have to sing of that. something. Before yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, the, the idea was this, this young... Oh, here we go. So every one of those squares is a different voice, and the singer is sitting alone somewhere in the world, in their dorm room, their living room, and they're watching a little conductor track that I made and singing alone, and then they upload all of their parts to YouTube. We take and put them all together, and then we, we make these virtual choirs. And it started small. It started with uh, 185 singers from 12 countries. This one is the third one we did, and that's nearly 4,000 singers from 73 countries. But so when we made Deep Field and we knew we were doing the recording, so for the choir, instead of just getting a, tr a traditional choir to sing at the end, we did a virtual choir. And so the, the voices that you were hearing is over 8,000 singers from 120 countries singing there, uh, as young as three and as old as 101. Uh, and no, there's no audition. Every single person gets in. I know that sounds crazy because you'd think some people don't sing as well as others. <laughs> this is the other beautiful thing about voices. They scale beautifully. You know, if you've ever been to a football game and you hear 60,000 people singing, a lot of those people are drunk and, and <laughs> it just smooths over the rough edges. And the same thing happens here. It's like it just gets this beautiful, glowing, warm sound. So, so it's, it's, it really is something bigger than, than us at How the did end. How you get the word out? So, so to get the word out, I've, uh, it's social media. So it started small when I did the first one I just did on Facebook and, and, uh, and my website and said, we're going to try this thing. And then the first one went viral, and then choirs started hearing about it, and then each one just kept getting bigger and bigger. And so now we have the opposite problem, which is that we announce and only open the window for a very short time, because otherwise our servers will all get crashed. <laughs> yes? So, Maestro, I was going to ask, um, the cell phone, the smartphone component of Deep Field, how is that being received? You know, you, does it normally get done? It, it does. So now to add even more complexity to this crazy piece. So when it's performed live, there's a choir that rings the audience, so a live choir that sings. The orchestra's on stage. But then in order to get that kind of shimmering sound that's in the background there, what I do is, is I have everybody in the audience download an app that I've made, this Deep Field app. And when they start it, it's just got a big play button on it. It says, wait for the conductor. And then at the moment, right before the singer starts singing, I just turn to the audience and go, like this, <laughs> like Adam and God, right? And, and, uh, <laughs> and then from each phone is just a little shimmery electronica sound. On its own, it doesn't really sound like anything. But if you have two or three or 5,000 people in the audience, suddenly it's just glimmering. The, the, the whole, yeah, it's overtones, exactly. And it's basically that, that chord that's just shimmering back there. And so if we get to do it live here, it's really something to experience <laughs> it live that way because you, you, you feel like you're floating in space. If we send another gold record into space, I... I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It'll have to be a long gold record, but... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then, now. Yeah, that's right. To add additional complexity, you recently worked with Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, that's right. And they put together a film. Yeah. Do you want to say a word about that, or...? Yeah, is that all, all there is to say at this there's moment? There's a 23-minute film now that accompanies all of this. You can watch it on YouTube. It's in 4K. You can, you can watch it right there for free. Um, and it's, it, it's spectacular. I didn't have very much to do with it. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, other than they would send it to me you know, every month and say, yes. And uh, it's, it's truly extraordinary. And it starts here earthbound, the whole piece. And then you look up, and then we go to you know, very near objects. We start at the moon. Then we go to Mars. We go to Saturn. We go to Jupiter. Then, as the piece grows, we go to nebula, uh, nebulae here in our galaxy, and then we we pull out of the Milky Way and we start to see our local group, and then finally, where that climax is, you see the deep field image in in all its glory. Um, 
What's that? What's the title? Deep Field. Deep Field. Deep. Yeah, that's it, on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, if you um, get, just Google Eric Whitaker Deep Field, you'll find it. And, and the best part is then at the end of that film, you'll be able to see all of the singers from the virtual choir. You can see all those 8,000 voices as part of the film. And then if you really want a trip, then just let the credits run because it has all 8,420 singers in it. <laughs> just goes for a while. Credits and credits. Um, we have time for just a few questions from the audience. Let's do, yes. Seems to me if you could put together a truly massive choir, you might actually make a dent in world peace for like an Olympics or something. <laughs> it's a funny thing, isn't it, with, with singing where it, it um, yeah. One of the things that we noticed with, with the virtual choirs, I, I never could have imagined this. When, it, when I started the first virtual choir, it was just an experiment to see would the technology work. You know, if, if you just got everybody singing at the same tempo and in the same key, a choir would, would unfold. That, that's all that I thought. But when the first virtual choir, when, when it went up and we started to see the poetry of it, we, we couldn't believe it. You know, there were, there were singers, even in the first couple, in this one, for instance, in number three that I showed, there are singers from Pakistan, from India, from Libya, from Egypt, from Jordan, from Israel, from as far north as the Great Alaskan Bush and as far south as New Zealand. And it's exactly as you said, it, it, it immediately becomes post-political, post-racial, post-religious. It's just people. And I, I personally believe uh, singing is the most human thing we can do, most fundamental human thing we can do. We're all born with a voice. Some of you may think you can't sing. It's not true. He, everybody can sing with just a little bit of experience. Uh, and there's something about the unifying effect of singing together. Every time I'm in front of a group of people and, uh, well, here, I'll show you real quick. Can we do something? Yeah. So, um, um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a, not a great singer on a good day and I've got a terrible cold, but, um, mm, so what are you gonna sing? You're just gonna sing, la. Okay, wait for me, you ready? La. Okay, ready, we're gonna do it again. Ready? Yeah. Okay, again, you ready? Okay, so now what's, what's beautiful to me now is there's 200 people in a room who don't know each other, have never met before, and already we're making really subtle, nuanced music making, right? With small, large, but better than that for me is something maybe you didn't all notice, is that you're breathing with me exactly the way I breathe. So I started that first one, and you all took the breath with me to sing. You did it now, right? And then I went, and you, everybody had the same breath, and then it went, and it's, it's magical, right? We're instantly unified as a people. We have a single vision. There's, it's just, it's this mysterious built-in hack that we have as human beings. And so I don't think it's too far to say that there's actually a hint of world peace in the singing. Um, I prepared some questions, which I haven't had to use at all, but my last one, and I'll read it on here, is... How can choral music, where to go, how can choral music change the world? <laughs> so, Larry, you have yeah, there it is. You yeah. completely read my, read my mind. Uh, any other questions here? Oh, good heavens. Okay, we'll go there. Uh, do you always pre-structure your compositions? Yeah, I do now. I do now. It's, it's partly what I learned from my son, Ash, and then partly it's something that I learned at school. And I've kind of refined it. I call it now emotional architecture. Okay. And basically, what I try to do is try to imagine the emotional journey that I want the musicians and the audience to go on as the piece unfolds. So it also keeps you from kind of wandering off? So much, exactly. <laughs> you know, one of the things that, that we have against us as modern classical composers is there's no typical form anymore. So if you were Mozart, for instance, you wrote a symphony, it's very clear. There's three movements. The first one is fast, the second is slow, the third one is fast. That first movement usually has an A section, a B section, then you come back to the A section to do it again. Now that's not to take anything away from Mozart. What he did with those structures is mind-bending. But it's so nice to just know what you're doing. It's kind right? of like how we have a verse, chorus, verse. Oh, yeah, in pop songs, now. exactly, right? Like a pop song is super structured. So, so it's just helpful before you start down one of these paths to know, what am I doing here, right? It's like, instead of building a house one wall at a time, it's good to have a blueprint and then start building the house. Yes. When you're composing and you have different instruments, do you have in your mind's eye or your mind's ear, as it were, what it's to each one is to sound like and how they sound together? I try. I really try. And part of that is just listening to a lot of music and then looking at a lot of scores. 
So um, if I'm out in the wild and I hear a piece, Prokofiev is one of my favorite composers mm -hmm. and a brilliant orchestrator. The craft of orchestrating, making all those instruments sound the way they do, is a whole other craft from composing. And so oftentimes what I'll do is I'll hear something, say like Prokofiev, and then I'll just take the score and look how, like a, like a scientist, how did he do this? If you do this and you add this and a little bit of this, and then sometimes, if it's really good, I'll steal it directly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yep, that works, right? Um, and then sometimes I'll just take a, a really educated guess, my very best guess, and I'll get to that first rehearsal and start conducting it and be like, nope, that doesn't work at all. <laughs> Give me that back. <laughs> you know, and, and rewrite it. Um, but it's just a combination. I think I'm getting better and better at hearing it. Um, but I think it's a lifelong process. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you, and then you, and then I'm afraid we'll have to cut off questions, but yeah. yeah. I wanted to start out with a quick compliment, which was, uh, you mentioned the uh, James Horror thing, and I just want to say that uh, I recently was listening to the soundtrack for, um, what should we call it, uh, Cocoon, uh, and I felt a lot of that, like, nostalgia, a little bit, like, of the joyous, like, adventurous, you know, of his music, so I just want to say that was really, oh, that's a huge really, really cool. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the question was, uh, you mentioned Paul Stretch, or like, uh, like the, the program earlier. Yeah. And I wanted to say, did you, and I've used this before because I'm an audio geek as well. And um, the uh, there's a thing on it where you can actually render out, if you like have a three minute song, you could technically have your computers, if you're ready to have your computer sit there for a little bit. Have you tried, like it can have it go for like three years sometimes. Oh my God. You can actually, <laughs> can't really. You, there's, there's, yeah, that, uh, did you try that with any of the? Yeah, I will now. <laughs> <laughs> Very deep field. That's yeah. next year. Yeah, right. <laughs> Deeper than deep. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. I, I know I said you, but I can't, I can't resist you right in front of me. But go ahead. Yes. We met at the Big Sing. It was one of the most wonderful experiences. The two of you met at the Big yes. Sing. How beautiful. And it's one of the most wonderful experiences of our lives. And we want to know if you're going to do it again. We are, absolutely. So. Yeah. They, so, so for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm composer in residence with the Los Angeles Master Crowd, which is a professional choir here in L.A. And last year we did our first big sing where we took Disney Hall and, and basically everybody in the audience was singing. So we, we gave a concert and people who, of all singing levels, some, some people who don't sing really at all and some people who are quite accomplished. It was a phenomenal evening, wasn't it? Also, with all the other all the other uh, locations that that were linked. Oh to us. yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, then, then by yeah. satellite, well by by internet, we connected five other locations around California. So there were thousands of people in each location singing and syncing together with us uh, over the internet. And yeah, it was good. It was good. Yeah, we'll do it. I think it's September actually is when they're looking now. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank and, you. Uh, I have to ask, how many in the in the audience were present for Sacred Veil? Vale? in this summer, this past spring. Yeah, yeah there was a piece, uh, and you know, we need another hour, so I'm not gonna do it, but oh my gosh. Uh, I have never been in a concert where not only everybody in the audience was crying, and I mean everybody, but the members of the chorale were crying on stage. I'm sure you noticed you were conducting them. <laughs> but uh, it was, it was, it was an incredibly powerful m piece and experience and uh, so if you haven't already just made sure you go to every single concert that is yeah there. So you just well, the, make sure you do the, the corral you, you in general they're, they're, the corral they're in general so yeah, they're just unbelievable but um, but that was a spectacular and and um, you know you made me cry more than I you know more times I you know oh little tree you know <laughs> oh, the seal lullaby it's been so sad um, oh, I should tell you, I'm super excited if I can take a moment. So I'm writing a little opera right now. So this is for, um, for this Christmas. It's a Christmas opera. Do you know The Gift of the Magi? Do any of you know that story? Yeah, so I'm going to set that. So this will be in December oh, if any of you want to come see. It'll be, it'll be with the chorale and on stage. I'm writing it for my wife, Laurence, who's here in the audience. Uh, yeah, so it's... Newlyweds. Woohoo! <laughs> Two months, baby. <laughs> It was one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, as a, and you, there's, okay, uh, the difference of writing when you're in love and experiencing joy uh, in life versus those other times in life when... Oh, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, how, how does it change your process? Yeah, it's such a process of a heavy word, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, and I, well, what's interesting is I wrote The Sacred Veil all the time when I was with Laurence and up to us getting married, and so I would say... Um, 
well, not to get super personal, and I don't want to embarrass you, baby, but um, <laughs> I, I think I was able to to find a level of vulnerability in the writing. You were talking about, it, it's a piece about, it, the poetry was written by a dear friend of mine who lost his wife to ovarian cancer. And he wrote about the entire journey, about from the moment they fell in love, to the moment she got sick, and to the moment they passed, she, uh, or she passed. And, and she left a couple of children behind, uh, three and six years old. It was, it was terrible. And so trying to write that and do justice to that piece, um, I had to really go to that place, you know, as much as I could and be as empathetic as possible and be present for Tony, for my friend. I also knew his wife very well. And so I don't think I could have done it had I not been with Laurence, that it was, it's, that it's something about our relationship and being in love like that. I was just, I was wide open, completely vulnerable. Yeah, it's a, probably a singular moment in my life. Thank you for sharing that. I realize it was an intrusive question, but I appreciate it. No, thank you. Um, Just one more question. It's yeah. connected to uh, Will the Earth made a sound that no one knows the origin of. It was about maybe a couple months ago. It was reported as being not correlated to any, like, uh, you know, geotectonic activity. Literally, the Earth. I don't think it was a farce, like the onion or something. It, wasn't, it was real. <laughs> and did anybody hear about this? The Earth made, like, a high pitch. Resonance that. that was a sound. That was the day we got married, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All the angels in heaven. <laughs> 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 Analyzing a sound like that, do you know what I'm saying? Is it, is it available to somebody get it on, on record? Yes, yes, we have it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. have to research it and you'll have to come back and we'll find out and answer your question. So before we do our pretty pictures and before we say goodbye, let's all say a huge thank you to Eric. Oh. For being here.